welcome. In this lecture, we're going to be doing very small simulation problems, and we're going to do it by hand. We're not going to need any fancy schmancy computer for it, but these are real simulations. Why might we want to do simulation by hand before we start learning about simulation programming? Uh, for very simple reasons. Uh, for one thing, it helps you to understand exactly what's going on in a discrete event simulation if you actually have to do it yourself um, by pencil, paper, calculator. Um, and for another thing, as, as we know, uh, and if we do any programming at all, uh, if you can't do a problem on your own, then you really can't write a, a program for it. You need to know what's going on. Uh, and if you do a simple uh, problem by hand, then you can program increasingly complicated and complex simulations uh, digitally. Simple example where we would like to simulate demand. Uh, suppose we know that demand follows a particular probability distribution, uh, the first one that you see. Actually, they're both really the same. And uh, we've got an enumerated uh, dis probability distribution. Um, there's a 20% chance that demand will be zero units in any one week, a 30% chance of a demand being one, a 40% chance of two, and a 10% chance of three. Make sure, as usual, all your probabilities add up to 100%, because uh, that's the universe. So knowing that, how do we simulate weekly demand? Um, we could th th take easily now, just take digits, uh, as long as we have a way of generating digits. We've got 10 digits to work with, the digits 0 through 9. 20% um, probability, 20% out of 100%, uh, you need two digits, 0 and 1. For 30%, you need three digits. For 40%, you need four. For 10%, uh, you need one. Um, so you see how the digits are assigned um, to the um, demand per week based on the probability. Now we just need a way of generating random digits. And when we do that, for the first week, suppose we get a five. Oh, we take a look up in the table, and we see that uh, that means for that particular week, demand must be 2. Uh, let's continue with this and see what it looks like on the next slide. Continuing here, um, you can see the randomness uh, over 10 weeks. Uh, the random digit that was uh, sampled, uh, let's say from a table of random numbers, it could have been generated in any way that you can generate uh, random digits. Um, the first week, indeed, the number was 5, so demand was 2. The second week, um, the random digit was 8. The third week, 9. And so each one of these random digits ends up translating to simulated demand. And you can see that in the right column. Over 10 weeks, if we add up all uh, the demand per week, you get 18 you know, divided by 10. The number of weeks is 1.8. So the average weekly demand is 1.8. And if you need the standard deviation, you've got 0 0.97. Uh, so here's one way of using a very, very simple simulation uh, in order to estimate a parameter. And the estimate in this case is x bar. It's um, the sample mean weekly demand. Um, and of course, uh, it's a sample over 10. If we generated more, we'd have a larger sample. But it's a random sample. If we go and do this all over again and generate different random numbers over 10 weeks, what, ha what will happen? We'll get a different uh, 10 weekly demands. We'll get a different average. And both of them will be estimators of the true average mu 
which since this is a simple probability distribution that's totally well known, we actually know what the um, mean of the population is. It's the expected value of x. Okay, pause for a minute, think about it, and why don't you figure out what it is and you can compare it to our point estimate. Here we go, we did it again. A different set of 10 random numbers. Uh, we got a different weekly demand for each, uh, for each week, uh, generating one random number per week. Ended up with a, an average of 1.3 this time with a standard deviation of 1.06. So now we have two different uh, X bars if we generated 100 samples, we'd have 100 different X bars. Each one of the X bars is an estimate of the true mean, uh, which is, did you figure it out yet? Let's take a look at the next slide. Okay, um, very simple. We just get the expected value. Um, taking uh, each value, each outcome, in the probability distribution, multiplying it by the probability, adding all those products up, and you end up with 1.4. So the actual mu, the actual average weekly demand of the probability distribution is 1.4. And of course, you're not going to get the same exact same value. The probability of getting a 1.4 is pretty much zero. Uh, but every time you generate another sample, you're going to get another uh, sample estimate. So simulation is very similar to what you've already been doing in your statistics courses, isn't it? Um, it's just that you're collecting the data um, from um, an algorithm instead of collecting it out there in the world. Here's where you take a moment to think. Uh, we do know the population parameter mu. We know the true average uh, mean weekly demand. Why in the world do we need simulation? Is there something, some additional advantage that we could get by working with the sampling distribution of the X bar? Uh, sampling weekly demand, getting the average. Um, it, there's really no easy uh, answer to that. Well, yeah, the easy answer is if this is all we're talking about, then sure, let's get the expected value. That's all we need, but it never is. Real life has much more complexity than this uh, very, very simple uh, problem that we have here. The beauty of the simple problem is that it's easy to see how to do simulation. And we can expand that and, and apply it when we have more complicated simulations where we can't find uh, an analytic solution. We don't know how to find the population parameters and we do have to generate data in order to estimate them. Here's another problem. It's still extremely simple, much more complex, or at least to a degree more complex uh, than the demand problem that we looked at before. Uh, we have a, a checkout stand, a, a small, let's say, gift shop in a hospital or an airport, and we want to simulate um, the checkout. Uh, people walk in. We don't look at how much time they spend wandering around the store. We're only interested when they get to the checkout and they're ready to pay. Uh, there's only one cashier. It's, remember, it's a small store. Uh, however, we're assuming we'll never run out of room for the customers who either are in service or waiting to pay. Um, what we want, what do we want to know? You always want to make sure of what your objective is in a simulation experiment, indeed in any experiment. We want to know the average time customers spend in the system, and that includes waiting in line to pay and being in service. And in addition, we want to know the percentage of time that the checkout clerk is idle. Um, we want to see if, 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 if that clerk pays for himself or herself and has enough work to do it. It is a small store. What are our assumptions, our givens? We're told that the time between successive arrivals of customers 
is coming in according to a uniform distribution from one through 10 minutes, and these are integers. The service time, the amount of time required to service each customer is also a uniform distribution uh, and it uh, varies from one through six minutes, also integers. Notice we're keeping things very simple here. To build our simulation model, we're actually uh, simulating by hand here. Uh, so it's a, it's a uh, thought model, you might say. Um, we are going to get 10 poker chips and uh, one die, six-sided die. And we're going to use those in order to generate random numbers from the probability distributions that we need, the uniform probability distribution from 1 to 10, which um, gets us uh, customer arrivals, and the uniform probability distributions from 1 to 6, which gets us customer service times. And we can, by doing this, generate a whole stream of random numbers for customer arrivals, a stream of customer arrivals, according to this distribution, and a stream of service times according to its distribution. Uh, that's our input. And once we have that, all we have to do is keep track of it the same way that we did weekly demand. And it's basically now a very, very simple uh, bookkeeping problem, um, which we can put into a list a table, or even a spreadsheet, as we'll see on the next slide. Take a look at this spreadsheet over here, or table, however, <laughs> however you'd prefer to, to refer to it. Um, we, we're going to uh, do this simulation run for 20 customers. You see the 20 customers there, one per row. Um, we have to make a decision on when the simulation starts. We're going to say it starts when the first customer comes into the system. Uh, maybe there's one customer waiting at the door when you open uh, the gift shop. Uh, we're going to keep track of uh, time. Uh, the two inputs you see are uh, generated um, as number of minutes. The first column, number of minutes since the last arrival. And of course, the first customer starts at time zero. So there was, were no minutes since the last arrival. That was not a random number generated. However, the second customer uh, comes in at time uh, three, three minutes, um, because the, the uh, first chip that was pulled had the number three on it. Uh, so uniform distribution between one and 10 for the customer into arrival time. Uh, the first customer is at time zero. The second customer is at time three. Um, the third customer is after an inter arrival time of seven. So that's at time 10 and so on. Uh, really, all this is, is is just a bunch of bookkeeping. Uh, for the service times, we have the die. So we're getting, by tossing the die, we get a service time between 1 and 6 for each customer. And you can see the stream of service times right there for each of the 20 customers. And then we've got clock times because we we want to keep track of the number of customers in the system, which is going, there's going to be a lot of flux there. And if you're going to look for an average number of customers in the system, it would have to be a time average, right? And we also want to know uh, how long and whether the clerk is idle so that we can keep track of that statistic. Um, the MOEs, measures of effectiveness at the right side of the table, uh, those are the uh, metrics that you're interested in. That's what, that's what you're running the simulation for. Um, now, for clock time, what are we keeping track of for each customer? What time the customer comes in, the customer's arrival? Uh, what time the customer begins service? Okay, remember, we're assuming that we're not keeping track of how long the customer was in the store before they're ready to pay. So arrival at time zero means, okay, the customer is ready for pay, to pay for something at time zero. Admittedly, this is artificial, and it could be made more complex. And presumably, you do that. You start with a simpler model, and then you add layers of complexity. Right now, we're happy to work with this one. Um, the customer arrives at time zero. There's no queue. There's no waiting. 
the clerk is ready, so the customer goes into service at time zero. That customer service time is one, so service ends at one, and the customer leaves the system. How long was the customer in the system altogether? Waiting time plus service, one. Um, the clerk was not idle at all uh, during that one minute. And you, you can see how that first customer boots up the system and then each successive inter-arrival time brings in a new customer. Um, and and the take a, take a minute, you know, you really do yourself a favor. I'm not going to read off every row. Pause this and get a handle on um, the data that was generated that you're looking at. Here's the, uh, the statistical output that we got from the system. Uh, first, we're looking for average customer time in system. Uh, customer time in system, for each customer, adding them all up, we got a total of 68 minutes, uh, divide by 20 customers, and on the, eight, on the average, uh, an average customer was in the system waiting plus service uh, 3.4 minutes. Uh, the, the cashier idle, altogether the cashier was idle 55 minutes out of the total time that the system was running. Well, the last customer left the system at time 118. So that's 55 divided by 118, or 47% idle, uh, which is the complement of utilization. So the utilization for this system would be 53%. And this is all stuff that you remember from your sim your the simplest part uh, of your the queuing component of your operations research course. Um, of course, there were a lot of um, there were a lot of oversimplifications here. Naturally, we're using integers. We have a small sample. Um, we're 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 limited because we're doing things by hand and everything takes more time than it should um, and yet we have all the elements of a simulation every simulation that you end up doing is going to have all the elements that you see here and we'll look at them in the, in a minute uh, the only difference is that you're going to be using a computer algorithm which um, means it's going to run more efficiently. Uh, you can collect more data. You can uh, get better randomization. Uh, and you, you know, but, uh, but the basic stuff, the basic components are here. Uh, you can learn a lot from this problem. We learn from this simulation um, that will apply to just about every simulation we do during the semester. Well, for one thing, it's a discrete event simulation model. No matter how we do it, whether it's uh, poker chips uh, or a computer algorithm in a specialized programming language or in something like Python, um, we're working with a system and a model, both, uh, that are discrete event. The system changes at discrete moments in time. In this particular case, the system and thus the model that we build on the system change um, when, when what? What are the events? Well, for one thing, when a customer enters the system. When a customer enters the system, there's one more customer in the system, for one thing. The customer may or may not go into service right away, may have to wait in the queue, and so on. Um, the system changes again when a customer finishes service and leaves the system. There's one less customer in the system. Those are discrete events. Um, they happen at discrete moments in time. The system doesn't change continuously. It changes at discrete points. Um, but like every simulation model, we have uh, three important components, three important elements. Randomness, moving time, and collecting output statistics. Um, we took the easy way out here and considered uh, generating uh, random variates by using uh, probabilistic devices, a, a die and a poker chip, uh, creating an artificial environment for the simulation experiment. Um, we moved time 
by uh, the values that we generated based on the, these uh, random devices. And we move time at discrete moments when, when a, an event happened. Um, and we collected the output statistics every step along the way so that when the simulation was finished, we could um, get averages and analyze the, the uh, output. Here's a new example that's called the staggering drunk. What we want to do is watch um, a drunk on a cityscape walk around, not knowing where he's going because he's drunk, um, and basically randomly choosing a direction to walk. Uh, he starts at, let's say, point zero, a street corner somewhere, and uh, he walks, he's, there's an equal probability that he'll go in any direction, north, south, east, west. So um, each, each direction, there's a one quarter chance at, that he'll go at any corner that he'll walk in, in that direction. Um, if he makes this decision 10 times, what's the probability that he'll end up within two blocks of where he started? This is a very good problem for simulation uh, because um, it, it's, um, it's a classic random walk problem. And uh, what you'd like to see is exactly what happens each run of the simulation. Um, and if you have enough data, you can easily get the probability that's asked. How are we gonna build this model? Um, we're going to say that at each corner, uh, the direction is modeled by a tuple, X and Y. X is the east-west west axis, Y is the north-south axis. So if the drunk moves east, um, then we, let's say, where is it? Uh, add one to x. West, subtract one from x. Uh, north, add one to y. South, subtract one. And so you can see how this, how this can be a good way of modeling uh, the, ra the, the random walk or, or the staggering drunk problem. Um, at the end of the whole operation, at the end of the whole exercise, we take the current value of x and y in absolute value, add them up, and uh, see how far from 0, 0 the guy ended up. Um, so in order to actually implement this model, what we need is for the randomness, uh, one way to do it is to get two digit random numbers. And uh, you need, you know, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth. So you have random numbers from zero, zero to 99. And uh, let's go to the next slide and we'll see how uh, we implement this model. Um, we had with random numbers, two digits. If the random number is between 0 and 24, the guy goes east, and we add 1 to x. Between 25 and 49, uh, the guy goes west. We, add, we subtract 1 from x. Between 50 and 74, that translates to north. We add 1 to y. Between 75 and 99, south, and we take 1 away from y. And if necessary, uh, you can take a look at this flow diagram, um, which basically is a an algorithm um, of you know wh whether we're doing this as a human being or programming for a computer, it'll work either way. And here you have the results of five trials. Uh, each trial is ten blocks. And so there's, you know, 10 random numbers generated, 10 two-digit random numbers generated in each trial. And um, trial number one, x at the, at the end of the whole thing, x is negative one, y is negative one. So that's within two of the starting point. 
Trial number two, x0, y is negative four, so no, not within two blocks. And if you look at all of the five trials that we see here, um, three out of five are within two blocks. It's a very small sample. Can you really extrapolate? Can you generalize from this uh, to the full probability distribution? Probably not a good idea. It's probably a better idea to generate more data, but it gives you a very good idea of how this works. So to sum up, we've looked at a simulation without constraining ourselves to a computer and without worrying about whether we're writing our computer program in Excel, in Arena, in C++, in Python or Java or SimScript or Simio. Uh, all we want to do here is have something simple enough so we can actually follow the simulation by hand um, with pencil and paper. And that's what we did with two examples. It's just an algorithm. We can do the algorithm with paper and pencil. We can do it on a computer. Um, it's going to be the same, just a matter of maybe scale, efficiency. It's not going to be necessarily more effective to do this on a computer. It's just that you can do more, more runs, more uh, better probability distributions, um, more replications. Uh, but you're going to have all of these elements in any simulation that you do this semester. And I hope this lecture has been a good learning experience for you. Thank you for attending the lecture.